We are uh, about to start this webinar, uh, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, the three latest must-know cases in international tax controversy. Uh, I know it's a little bit of a heavy subject before Thanksgiving, but uh, better to do it now than before Christmas, I suppose. <laughs> Although we have one of the rulings, uh, oral arguments coming in uh, early December. So thank you. Uh, let's just go through the agenda quickly. I think uh, there we go. Perfect. So we're going to do uh, brief introductions on the panelists and our firms. Uh, we're going to walk through, you know, the the kind of the reason why we're here, why these cases have come about uh, in the last year. Uh, the next sections are going to be uh, a panelist going through the cases, the the rulings, uh, the facts, and and ultimately what we might be able to do about them. There's three cases that we're going to talk about today. Uh, wrapping it up with some disclosure rules, new disclosure rules that will go into effect in 2024. Um, and lastly, any Q&A that we might have uh, uh, about 10 minutes or so at the end to wrap things up. So if you have questions, please uh, put them in the comment section or the questions. We will get to them and uh, uh, and try to answer everything as best we can. Okay, so let's move on to introductions. So my name is Wayne Lai. I'm an international tax partner at Anchin. Uh, we have a, a bunch of panelists and, and uh, presenters today that I'll go through. First off, our firms. Anchin is a full service accounting firm. Uh, we've been around for about 100 years now, actually 100 years on the dot this year. And we are, uh, you know, we service mainly private businesses, investment funds, high net worth individuals. And it's the full range of CPA services that you would expect, you know, financial reporting, uh, tax solutions, advisory, and, and private client. So we're joined here by a law firm, Whiteford, Preston, and Taylor. They've been around for almost 100 years as well. It looks like 90 years. And uh, uh, they've got 200 attorneys that provide comprehensive range of business law and litigation services. Uh, you know, they've serviced clients from startups to middle market companies to Fortune 100, and uh, they have a growing presence in the, in the mid-Atlantic mid region. So our first, uh, uh, one of our first uh, panelists is Alan Goldenberg. He is a principal at Anchin and the leader of our controversy in state and local practice. Alan has more than 20 years of experience in tax accounting and law matters and represents taxpayers before the IRS and state and local tax authorities. Uh, you know, Alan offers guidance throughout the life cycle of tax controversy matters from initial response through final resolution and helps address uh, initial audit inquiries and disputes along with orchestrating uh, any administrative protests. So Alan is our Anchin go-to guy on uh, tax controversy in state and local matters. Uh, I, I'm an international tax partner, as I mentioned. I have uh, about 16 years experience in the international tax, uh, in the international tax industry. And uh, I mainly do uh, plan, a lot of cross-border planning for our clients that include individuals, corporations, and partnerships. Uh, I have a pretty wide range of um, clients from public uh, public companies to private equity funds, startups, and high net worth individuals. Uh, next, lastly from Anchin is Kevin Brown. He's a principal in our international tax group. Uh, Kevin specializes in helping uh, high net worth individuals and families, investors uh, with complex you know, tax planning inbound into the US and helping them navigate US, federal, state, and local tax rules. Uh, he, you know, specifically has a lot of, uh, as you'll hear from his accent, he's got a lot of connections with the UK and, and Europe where he's originally from. So uh, Kevin is our go-to uh, partner for inbound tax planning for these types of uh, clients. Uh, next, uh, from our law firm, uh, uh, panelists. We have Liz Atkinson. Liz is the co-chair of the business department, and she focuses her practice on Fed 
state, local, and international tax issues. Um, she has expensive, expensive, <laughs> extensive, sorry, <laughs> extensive experience in uh, tax planning and tax litigation. She handles administrative and judicial controversies, uh, which have included favorable outcomes on numerous audits, appeals, and collection matters. And she's also testified before Congress. Lastly, uh, uh, Mario De Castro is a partner and co-chair of the Tax and Private Wealth section at Whiteford. And uh, he advises globally active enterprises and closely held family businesses on tax and related international business matters. Uh, he has industry focus in private equity, real estate technology and communications, fintech, uh, uh, bio life and cryptocurrency issuers, among others. He is a uh, frequent speaker in cross-border and uh, business and transaction matters and is also fluent in Spanish. So um, what kind of brought us here uh, and, and got us to the point where we have three really uh, seminal cases uh, in different courts on international tax matters is, you know, uh, basically determining the constitutionality um, of the treatment of both the IRS's ability to automatically apply its statutory authority um, and and really, it, it 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 revolves around a lot of the penalties and and uh, assessments that the IRS has been issuing out for the last several years. There's also a, a focus on the constitu constitutionality of several provisions of the TCJA, which was passed in 2017. And why it's so important is because the penalties from uh, the international reporting that U.S. taxpayers are required to meet is very is, is severe and, and pretty high, as uh, many of you know. So, you know, for a very long time, the IRS has been issuing automatic notices for missed filings. And at a minimum, you know, these forms have a $10,000 per form per year penalty. Uh, and so we, we've all seen cases where, you know, people or taxpayers or clients have been assessed, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars in penalties for um, essentially missed information reporting. So on top of any potential tax they may have, oh, this is, these are penalties that are being applied um, by the IRS that have caused a lot of distress to our clients and taxpayers. Uh, and 10%, I'm sorry, 10,000 uh, per form is kind of the minimum bar for uh, uh, you know, missed international tax filings. Some forms have, you know, a 35% penalty on distributions or transfers to foreign trusts. And of course, the FBAR penalties for foreign financial accounts, uh, you know, has a 50% penalty on um, the highest uh, unreported value of, of any accounts. So I think I'm going to hand it off now to Kevin, who is going to moderate the panel. Um, uh, and take us through the cases. Cool. Thanks, Gwen. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. Um, I think, as uh, Gwen has just uh, outlined here, really the purpose of the program is hopefully to provide some insight or thought around these three cases, um, particularly given the dollars and penalties involved uh, can be substantial and really affected a lot of our clients um, amongst the panelists here. So, um, I'm going to, as Gwen said, kind of, I guess, moderate and uh, ask certain questions of our three uh, experts and panelists on this issue. And the first case we're going to be dealing with is the Bittner case. Um, we've called this the good, the bad and the ugly. I'm not sure whether that applies to each case individually, collectively, by aggregate. I think, Mario, you're dealing with the Bittner case. Um, this one may fall into the category, category <laughs> of good, uh, I, I, I think more than anything else. So, um, uh, Mario, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Very right, great, great. Good Good morning or good afternoon. Um, let's start off with Bittner, just in general terms, right? So under the Bank Secrecy Act, U.S. persons and companies, as, as we all probably know, are required to file on a calendar basis. The report to report to FinCEN of the, of the Treasury all financial interests in which a U.S. person may have signature authority or ownership in. Right. And uh, kind of some of the thresholds are yeah, but um, you report um, foreign bank accounts or financial accounts 
with uh, with assets exceeding ten thousand USD in the aggregate and in the aggregate at any time during a calendar year, or if you have a U.S. person that that uh, controls or owns uh, greater than fifty percent in a in the uh, in equity or in shares in a foreign company. Okay, so Bitner is interesting, and and well, well, part of the good it, it brings up several interesting questions. Um, so Bitner that came down back in February of this year held that the maximum penalty under the Bank Secrecy Act for non-willful failure to report financial interest and or signature authority in foreign financial accounts applies on a per account basis, okay, rather than on a, um, a, a per report basis, sorry, rather than on a per account basis, which is which is um, very favorable to taxpayers. This It's a breakthrough because under the BSA, the IRS is permitted to impose a penalty on any person, okay, who violates or causes any violation of the statute. Um, Non-willful civil penalties under the statute are set at $10,000, while willful violations carry um, greater penalties of up to $100,000 or $144,000 uh, penalty range as adjusted for inflation, uh, or up to half of what uh, the balance in an account. The, the facts in Bittner are interesting because we have Alexander Bittner, who was a dual citizen of the US and Romania, he had dozens of foreign bank accounts, uh, 272 to be exact. And he was living overseas and he was unaware uh, of, uh, of his filing requirements. And he failed to file FBARs for five consecutive annual reports over, over five years. Um, Alexander eventually filed new and corrected FBARs once he became aware of his, of his obligations. However, when it came to imposing penalties, the IRS took the view that the 10,000 non wolf violation penalty applied to each to each of his 272 accounts. Um, the, the court came, came back and said, no, that's not correct, uh, and overturned the Fifth Circuit's ruling, um, which, which was uh, pro-IRS or pro-Treasury, um, and held that non wolf violations under the Bank Secrecy Act for FBAR requirements equates to failing, to failing to file annual FBARs rather than failing to file an FBAR for each individual account that the taxpayer may have an interest in, okay? Um, so the IRS, the, uh, the Supreme Court's decision is 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 uh, is part of the good because Mr. Bittner, in this case, was subjected only to $50,000 in penalties uh, rather than a potential $2.7 million in penalties. Um, the logic behind Bittner is, is an important one. In the majority opinion, First, took a look at the language and the construction, okay, behind the the Bank Secrecy Act provisions. In doing so, um, they found that the Congress used a per account definition in other parts of the BSA, but not when discussing the penalty for non willful violations. This meant that Congress really had no intent for non willful viol non willful violations to be penalized on a per account basis. So, in this vein, the court found uh, other guidance issued by the federal government through warnings fact sheets and instructions where failure to re file a report um, was a single violation for a non willful violator with a penalty of only $10,000. The court noted, and based on the draft, they noted that based on the drafting of the BSA provisions, Congress was far more concerned, okay, with collecting the necessary information uh, rather than, uh, than uh, punitively penalizing um, a, a taxpayer for, for non willful mistakes. And finally, the court went on to explain that the per account interpretation of the BSA uh, provisions could create anomalies or inequities where willful violators would be subject to smaller penalties rather than non-willful violators, right? So it's interesting that the play on words here or, or what is considered willful versus non-willful. I, I, I would think, Kevin, that if, if you open up a bank account today with a million dollars in, in an offshore account, say in, in London or whatnot, and right before, uh, uh, Right as you you become aware of your of your obligations, right? You willfully or you you transferred out or transfer out the underneath the threshold um, in, in kind of a in a purposeful manner, uh, and then then say, oh, I forgot that 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 kind of you know not to be funny or 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 make this seem too elementary. That would be willful, but you know non-willful is is simply um, going about your business and and um, realizing that you've made a mistake and then quickly, quickly hearing that mistake, right? And, and coming yeah. clean with it. 
And on, on that part, when we're talking about the Spintner case, Mario, we we uh, we initially say, and I hear a lot of lawyers say this around, some cases have bad facts um, yeah. in essence for uh, in relation to the taxpayer. And, and we have a case here where it appears as though there were bad facts potentially on the clients or the taxpayers part, but eventually won. And I think you alluded to the fact here that really the, the point of law revolved predominantly around willful versus non-willful. Right, right. Right. And I think, and I think is that the, fair, even though with bad facts, that doesn't necessarily mean that a case will go one way or the other. It's just the 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 the, the facts at the heart of the matter, if that makes sense. Not yeah, the law exactly. at the heart of the matter. Correct, correct. It it really does turn on the facts and, and what was the the uh the intent and the behavior of the taxpayer. Okay, so if we move on and go through how this, uh, this case was kind of a judge. It was a pretty close close case in the end, 5-4, mm -hmm. uh, essentially. Um, and where we are with the future of willful versus non-willful. Um, I, I guess my first, like, what, why was the case so, why was it so close in the end? Were, were there any dissenting voices and, and why? Well, I think um, on the dissent, on the dissent, if I'm not mistaken, um, it was Justice Barrett, uh, who joined Justice Thomas and Sotomayor and Kagan, which is an interesting combination, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, for in terms of as as reading clubs or book clubs would go, <laughs> and and they argued that the statutory language, okay, behind the Bank Secrecy Act, basically implied that F bar violations should be penalized on a per account basis. Specifically, okay, the dissent argued that the the Bank Secrecy Act set, uh, section um, 5314 indicated that the reporting requirement should attach to each individual account since the statute requires a U.S. person to file an FBAR when there is when there is a relation with a foreign financial agency or an account. So if you ever, that when you go through and you, and you fill out the FBAR, right, um, you kind of go account per account, right? So they, yeah. they took a very strict a strict view of how these forms are actually um, completed. You know? In contrast to the majority, uh, the dissent further argued that the per account language in other provisions within the BSA section should also apply to non-willful penalties. You know, and then finally, the dissent argues that the BSA differentiates between the form used to report the foreign accounts and the actual FBARs themselves, stating that um, this shows that the penalty should apply to each report or account disclosure and not simply to the annual report, right? Or to the, the aggregate that makes up the report. I guess the, looking at where we are now um, in relation to the IRS's viewpoint of this, having lost this case essentially and, and ruled very, very uh, kind of uh, delicately in favor of the taxpayer, clearly the importance of willful versus non-willful um, for us, our clients, and uh, our kind of peers and colleagues is, is, is more important than ever in relation yes. to this. Um, and you mentioned that that you like the IRS have started to push back on certain non-willful disclosures, are potentially arguing for them to be willful. willful. Yeah, there's a lot of purposeful. So have like, you got some real life, obviously no name examples of that, but uh, I, uh, we, we've started to see that as well. But but is is that a worry? I guess for us and and practitioners, no, it's it's definitely a worry, and I think it 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 goes to kind of the the as practitioners, there's a certain amount of due diligence that we need to need we need to become involved with, right? In terms of asking questions, kind of on the intake, kind of like when you go visit a doctor for the first time, right? Did you know? Did do you drink on a regular basis? Do you smoke <laughs> on a regular basis? Right, and you know I say that in jest, but but you know I we've seen where where clients will 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 come to us with with the you know with with a good faith intent to disclose right, and then you know kind of like you know and and just on at the ninth hour the eleventh hour uh, new facts kind of emerge right oh there was this this other account. Right or this other company that we had, right? Uh, oh, I didn't know about it. Uh, um, it it must have been my controller, or it must have been, you know, it must have been my dad. <laughs> you start to wonder as as um as 
as the facts kind of evolve, um, as a practitioner, you, you really have to get, have your antenna up and and try to figure out really is is it is it an innocent mistake? Is it an oversight? Right? Perhaps the person is just so busy with their financial affairs and 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 trying to uh, create a profit for his or her business that that certain things kind of slip through the cracks, right? Um, yeah. Until, yeah. Yeah. So it really is comes down to to judgment at the end of the day on, on both sides as as practitioners as well as on on the client side. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you for that, Mario. I think. Um... Perhaps the time will kind of move on to the next, but I think one of the things that we've we've historically done here at Angel and I've uh, done is um, even the the difference between non willful and willful is 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 a legal standard in this instance. And like one of yeah. the things we've always said and done is um, even in what appears to be a very cut and dry case, is to kind of you know uh, seek legal counsel to make sure the facts and circumstances will provide us with a non-willful disclosure and uh um i'm not sure if you'd agree Mario, uh mario but i wonder whether there's been a this has been in existence for a long time now to streamline the ovdp systems and everything that goes with it i i feel like there's potentially been a little flippancy uh around the willful non-willful dis uh, uh ability to to um uh disclose on that basis and i think we we have to go back again to make sure we are absolutely, you know, as, as as comfortable as we possibly can that that that, that our clients have done things on a non willful basis, really. No, I definitely agree, Kevin. I think over over the years, at least since I've been in practice, there's always the sense, you know, I grew up with 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 partners instructing me and and other practitioners, you know, with with the sense that oh, if you make a mistake, you know, just file for reasonable cause. It's you know, just say it wasn't willful, kind of almost almost like um like like an empty apology right and i and i think that that those days are long gone yeah no definitely um definitely we've got we've got a question here actually so um i'm not sure do you think we should uh answer the questions now as we go through this or at the end let's save, let's save it to the end yeah okay cool so so uh no question received um and we'll save that till the end thank you okay and, and you know kevin i think i think as, as i prepared last night and and something that Liz and I kind of um, discussed early this morning on, on our respective um, commute or at least on my commute <laughs> um, is this uh, this case that came down back in February in the district court of the Southern District of California called Aroeste A-R-O-E-S-T-E-V-U-S and that case involved potentially non-willful violation but it goes to the point of you know in this in this mobile workforce environment that we live in. In that case, you had uh, a chap that was a, a dual citizen, Mexico, well, the dual resident, in Mexican citizenship and a U.S. green card, right? And uh, and he inadvertently forgot he lives permanently, this person lived per permanently in Mexico, and uh, the FBAR requirement kind of kind of went went over overseen, right? So I think that, that um, I think it's going to be interesting in terms of from a factual uh, distinction perspective, depending on who your client is and 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 where they're working, right? You know, yeah. keeping these rules in place, especially with with mobile workforce like like we have coming out of COVID. No, definitely, definitely agree. I agree. Well, look, thank you so much, Mario. Um, yes. uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, so we're now going to move over to my partner, Alan uh, Goldenberg, about a case he and I have looked at. Reviewed a number of times, um, uh, gone into great detail. Um, so, Alan, I'm going to pass it over to you and uh, um, and the lovely world of Fahi. Hey, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Kevin. Great to be here. Good morning, everyone. I think if we look at the kind of the, the theme here, the good, bad, and the ugly, this case sort of has all three. Uh, good for, for taxpayers. There's potential refund opportunities that we'll talk about. Um, the bad. The IRS trying to assert authority in an area that they really didn't have the authority to do so. And the ugly to the congressional statute writers who really uh, missed a, a, a huge uh, provision um, in the law. Um, so I think it kind of fits fits all three. So just a little background about, about Fari here, just uh, to get things started. The case uh, centered around 5471 penalties. Wayne kind of alluded to these at the beginning of, of the presentation here. Um, $10,000 penalties for, for a misfiling. 
Uh, these typically are filed by taxpayers that have a 10% interest in, in a foreign corporation. Um, these are part of the income tax return, pretty extensive forms um, that do have to be filed. But in addition to the $10,000 penalty, um, if, if you're late and the, the IRS catches on to this, um, at 30-day increments, the IRS can assert additional $10,000 penalties um, up to really $60,000 in, in aggregate. And that is uh, per 5471 filing. So the, the potential assessments can actually increase uh, substantially, um, exponentially over time. And, and that's exactly what happened in, in this case. I want to flip to the, the next slide. The facts are is that uh, Fari, U.S. taxpayer, owned an interest in um, two, Kevin, you can flip the slide, uh, into two um, Belize corporations, one he owned from 2003, one he owned since 2005. Um, he didn't end up filing 5471s. The IRS went ahead, um, assessed the, the $10,000 penalties, assessed the, the additional $10,000 penalties per uh, 30 days. Um, penalties and, and interest kept building upon those quite substantially, and eventually the IRS moved to an intent to levy. At that point, uh, Fari actually challenged the IRS's authority on whether uh, the service itself could actually, in fact, assess these 5471 penalties. So just uh, as a little background and kind of explained on, on this slide, is that there are really two categories of penalties under the Internal Revenue Code. The first category of penalties are the typical ones that we see, the 6600 penalties, the, the typical you know, assessable penalties the, for late filing, underpayment penalties, et cetera. Those are the ones we, we typically see with our clients, though our clients always file on time and they never have any issues. But in those odd situations where that might happen, these are the usual um, assessable penalties that we see. Uh, that's, that's under Chapter 68 of the Internal Revenue Code. Separate from that is what's called punitive penalties under Chapter 61. And these 5471 penalties really fall underneath that category. Um, you miss the filing, bam, the IRS goes ahead and assesses a $10,000 penalty. There is no sort of due process um, that goes along with it. So moving I'll, to the I'll, next. Just a quick question on this. And I just, um, in terms of this, and going back to why I mentioned with Mario, would you say this a case in this case again initially when you're looking at the facts appear to be bad facts in the taxpayers kind of uh, uh, against the taxpayer? I, I, well, taxpayer won, so I think ultimately the facts are are ended up being good um, <laughs> in in that respect. Right. Um, however, we'll talk about it towards the end. Just because, and again, we'll get into sort of the nuances here with the statutory language. Uh, but just because the IRS may not have had the ability to go ahead and assess the penalty, there still is a statute that does assess a $10,000 penalty. Right. So it's a more of a function of a mechanism of how we get that penalty, or how the, the government ends up asserting the penalty on a taxpayer, as opposed to just the process that, that sort of happened here. And I think that's the sort of the distinction, um, again, the, the fact that, that there is a $10,000 penalty for a missed 5471 is, is legal and it's totally fine. That statute exists. Um, it's, the, again, the mechanism of how we get there. Got it. Okay. <laughs> so flipping to the, to the next slide, i just give you a little summary about um, sort of the, um, uh, maybe it's the slide before that, Kevin. Oh, um, okay. Just it. Okay, so sorry. So next slide. Uh, I apologize. So um, well, let's just talk very, very briefly about about the the arguments here that were placed um, that the IRS said. The IRS said essentially, like I mentioned, these um, uh, penalties under Chapter um, sixty eight are in fact assessable. Um, the IRS can go ahead. They do have the ability to, to assess these penalties on the taxpayer. It's automatic. And in fact, that was the practice of the IRS. Uh, what actually happened is, is that when there was a late file 5471, the system itself automatically cranked out the assessment. Um, and, that, and that was sent to taxpayers. Again, nobody has been technically reviewing the case. There so was no sort of due process. Taxpayer, on the other hand, said, wait a minute. That's not how the statutory language 
is actually written. Um, the, the IRS, in fact, was never granted the authority to go ahead and assess these penalties. Um, when you look at the typical uh, assessable penalties, there actually is language that the Congress gave to the Department of Treasury, which then go ahead, went ahead and provided that authority to the commissioner uh, of the IRS. So that didn't happen. The tax court ultimately agreed um, with the taxpayer and said, you're right, the IRS never had the authority um, to go ahead and assess these penalties. Rather, what the Department of Treasury should have actually done is gone to the Justice Department to actually bring a lawsuit um, against the taxpayer um, for these, these $10,000 penalties. So what are the takeaways of this ruling? And again, it's sort of favorable to the taxpayer. So that essentially is that certain 5471 filers, not all, but certain ones, um, potentially, if they were subject to such penalties or assess such penalties from the IRS, can either file for a refund or may not necessarily have to pay um, these, these penalties that, that were assessed. I say not all 5471 filers because we know there are five categories of, of those filers. Depending on which category the, the individual or the, the, the filer itself is, not necessarily individual, but the filer is, um, will depend on which penalty is applied. So in this situation for 5471s, um, you're looking at category one filers, which is a typical 10% owner of a foreign corporation, Category four filers, which are U.S. persons that have a greater than 50% interest in, in a foreign corporation, or category five filers, which are U.S. shareholders of a CFC at any point in the year, and that own stock basically uh, on the last day of that, that CFC's year. Um, Alan, on however, that, but as, as we've seen, we, we have clients that can be four, two, three, and five. Like, you know, they can be all sorts in that year. So in theory, they could be not subject to penalties on one disclosure, but potentially on the other, in theory. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, so and, and in fact, Kevin, it really expands beyond that. It's not just 5471s, uh, um, because the penalty statutes are sort of all lumped together uh, for various other forms. And we have a whole list of other forms here um, that also are potentially impacted by this FARI decision. Right, so 5472 is an example, um, 8938. So these are very common forms that, that we file for many of our clients um, that have you know, foreign assets um, or interest in, in overseas. Um, and again, these are penalties that the IRS tends to assess uh, that technically under the, this tax court decision, um, the IRS did not have the authority to do so. So let's talk about the, the refund opportunities here um, and, and where does the, the ruling really leave us. So um, there is potentially an opportunity um, for taxpayers who have been assessed uh, 5471 penalties and, and have paid them or some of the penalties on the other forms that, that we just discussed uh, to file um, for, for a protective claim for refund. And I stress the fact that it's potential and I stress the fact that it is a protective claim because the IRS has in fact uh, appealed the decision. So this is not necessarily final at this point. There still is continued litigation, but uh, taxpayers may wanna take advantage of, of a uh, protective claim in order to protect themselves from the statute of limitations running. Uh, usually taxpayers have two years um, to file a refund claim from whenever that, that payment is made. Um, so in order to be able to ensure that, um, that they can get uh, refunds if the case ends up being favorable, um, then they may wanna take advantage of, of filing this protective refund claim um, with the IRS to, to at least get it in under the wire. Um, I will say that, that there is another remedy out there um, which is obviously through Congress. Um, we know that tax rules can be applied retroactively. Um, does, and, and from our understanding, Congress was actually made aware of the statutory flaw uh, a, a long time ago, never did anything about it. Do they have an appetite to go ahead and, and fix this? I think as we've seen what's going on in Washington, um, there's no guarantee on anything right now, uh, but that is always something that's looming uh, that they can, you know, obviously make the change um, such that, you know, this, yeah. this may become moot. Great. 
Thanks, Alan. And so when you say remedy, just, just to make sure, you mean that's the IRS's remedy, not necessarily us and our clients, essentially? <laughs> in closing. Correct. Correct. <laughs> right. No, we, we want everybody to file for refunds. So as much as they can. <laughs> You know, again, it has to be somebody. I think the the facts, and we can talk about it later on, is that is that is it, it is kind of a targeted audience. I think who could take advantage of this, um, but but there's certainly worthwhile potential to to pursue this. Perfect. Thanks, Alan. I guess in looking at this from from what I hear, it's like we we this appears to be a technical win uh, or, or a win under technicality. Let me say that for the taxpayer, with uh, maybe a little more to come. Um. Great. Thanks, Alan. Really appreciate it. So, um, Liz, last but by certainly not least, um, over to you, uh, a case that's going through the Supreme Court at the moment. Many of us in uh, in the industry and practitioners, I guess, I'm not sure, I'm not sure the word excited is the right word here to be used, but I, I think some of us are kind of more intrigued uh, in relation to what's happening here with more, but um, I will hand it over to you to um, take us over the line here. Thanks, Kevin. And I think it is an exciting time to be in tax world with all this stuff going on. Like over your Thanksgiving dinner, you can talk about these tax cases instead of talking about politics, right? I'm not sure. But, I'm not sure what's happening over my Thanksgiving dinner. So, but, but <laughs> at any rate, um, Moore has the possibility. I think you know, is the most important case perhaps in our generation of tax cases. And it goes way back to the issue of, you know, we all remember the 16th Amendment was enacted to create the income tax because prior to that, there was no income tax. You know, the, the country got revenue from excise taxes and things like that. And so when that was enacted, um, there were cases following that interpreting where it was proper to apply a tax and all of us, you know, who suffered through learning the tax law, one of the first cases you hear about is this case called Eisner versus Makomer. And the question of what is a realization event? And, you know, all of us tax professionals spend a lot of our time on, you know, the question of when does a realization event occur? You know, what's reportable? All that kind of thing. Um, in more, the taxpayer, just, just to give a brief outline of the facts, it's a, it's a married couple, they're United States folks, they live here, they invested in a company in India. And, you know, we remember that the TCJA came along and made a lot of changes to the tax code. And one of the changes, a very significant change was the enactment of this transition tax. And the idea that the system was changing post TCJA and so this transition tax was designed to capture what would otherwise be, you know, income that didn't get taxed. Um, and so the Moors were subject to this based on their ownership in this Indian corporation, but they never actually got any money. And, you know, they're like the ordinary person going, okay, but I didn't get any money. How can I owe some tax? And, and we as tax professionals know there are situations where indeed you can owe tax, even though you didn't get money in your pocket. But in this case, they said, you know, Eisner versus Maycomer has not been overturned. It's still good law, stare decisis. And so it means that this trans transition tax is unconstitutional. Um, so here again, as you pointed out, Alan, uh, is time for protective refund claims, um, particularly because, you know, the transition tax was, you know, paid in installments. And so there, folks are running out of time to claim some or, or, you know, most of this tax statute has run, but they can claim something. Um, and so everybody's taken bets. Um, I haven't seen anything on fan duels where, you know, there's odds on this case, but um, there's been a lot of hoopla in the press about how wide ranging the decision could be in terms of its effect. Um, and the reply brief of the taxpayer was just filed, I, I believe, yesterday. Yeah. Um, and that brief very artfully kind of threads the needle to say Eisner versus Maycomer is still good law. There's not a realization event, but this is limited to the transition tax. And it basically takes the position that what is being taxed in effect with respect to the transition tax is a property right. 
and not accrued income. Um, and so I think it's a very, um, it's a careful argument, one that tries to steer clear of having an extremely broad ruling that may upend some other areas. Um, that doesn't mean if the taxpayers win in this case that other people aren't going to try to broaden the ruling. I expect they will. Um, but I think that this, the way it's crafted, may have a certain appeal to the court. We'll have to see what the allegiances are, because as Mario pointed out in his section with Bittner, it was a close decision. And you had some you know, alliances that you weren't necessarily expecting. And we may see that in this case, I've heard some folks say they don't think the taxpayers are going to win this case. Others that think, you know, the ruling is going to be too broad. And then, you know, um, if I had to make a prediction, I would say maybe a win for the taxpayer, but on as narrow a ruling as can be crafted. And, you know, there will certainly be probably some horse trading in the Supreme Court about who writes the opinion and, and what exactly does it say. There are a huge number of amicus briefs filed in this case on both sides of the issue. I don't think I've ever seen so many amicus briefs filed in a case. Um, I'm on the board of the Center for Taxpayer Rights, which files amicus briefs in cases and filed one, for example, in Bittner. Um, but you know, this case has things all over the map. And the oral argument is coming up on December 5th, which you can listen to online. Um, you can review all the pleadings online. So those of you who geek out on tax, like all of us on this call do, um, you know, have plenty of material to look at. Um, and I think we'll see a decision, you know, in the early part of next year. Um, but definitely, I think this is a time where, um, you know, any of your clients, um, you really need to comb through and see, do folks have potential refund claims that you need to be preserving you know, on on this issue, on penalty issues, um, really anything. It doesn't doesn't cost much to file a protective claim, and can really make a taxpayer happy if if something like this comes yeah. down the pike. And on the uh, just a brief question, so Danny's going to can you explain um, what the purpose of amicus briefs are? Because it's it's a term, as you said, I've never seen a case with so many. And therefore, I feel like it's been bandied about quite a lot. So <laughs> and maybe any importance around them. <laughs> yeah, Kevin, that's a great question. Um, literally, an amicus brief is a friend of the court, and it's designed to perhaps assist the court um, in making its determination by providing some perspective. Um, for example, in Bittner, one of the things that the Center for Taxpayer Rights argued was, and, and went through a lot of math exercise, um, Gwen Moore you know, did that brief in her firm and really did a great job of pointing out that this could impact low income taxpayers. And that um, while Bittner specific facts may not have been all that sympathetic, that you ha could have wild anomalies where a non willful set of penalties was actually much higher than willful penalties yeah. if you applied it per account. And so kind of giving some of those real life examples of what's the impact of this in the real world um, for the judges to think about. So in this case, a lot of the amicus briefs, some of the ones that are, you know, sort of siding with the government are saying, look, you know, this is a dangerous case. It could really bust the budget, uh, which is already, you know, a concern. Um, because it could be so wide ranging. And then on the other side of it and holding for the taxpayers is, you know, this whole line of cases, the whole jurisprudence of the 16th Amendment um, and saying that, you know, you, you it's important to have this concept of stare decisis and st settled law um, for people to be able to make decisions. And you can't just willy nilly come up with um, you know, this unique form of taxation that upends our system. And, you know, going down the line, there have been a lot of proposals about alternative types of tax. Elizabeth Warren has suggested, you know, a wealth type tax. So much of this is taking aim at those types of um, situations where you'd be taxing unrealized gains or you'd be taxing, you know, simply based on net worth you know, those kinds of things are, are in the background with the amicus briefs. So. 
really, really interesting and, and great reading. Who says tax is boring? <laughs> it, it applies to everything. It touches every aspect of our lives. So we, we need to pay attention. No, definitely. And I think, uh, thanks for that, Liz. And I think uh, as you were going through the arguments for and against, like one of the things I know we've all spoken about around something such as this being being kind of counted as being unconstitutional, um, you know, there's many, and, and you approach this, and I think in the next slides we go through this, but there's many instances in in the Internal Revenue Code where unrealized income is a thing. And, you know, I, I just uh, deemed liquidations with check the box elections, for example, or, um, you know, reorgs uh, that can specifically be chargeable or, you know, tax-free reorgs. Um, and then even FERPSA transfers, looking into kind of the international context. Like, in theory, if the taxpayer wins, could all of them be kind of, could, could they all be looked at? Uh, in theory, if, if, if you know, this, this, I guess it depends on how the ruling goes, but, but um, you know, they are really many instances of what we would consider probably unrealized income in that sense. Yeah, I think that that is really the question is, you know, what, you know, as things have evolved, because Eisner versus Maycomber is a very old case, you know, Absolutely. and so concepts have evolved since then. But, you know, there are a whole host of situations where, you know, there's a there's, let's say, a voluntary aspect to something so that you don't necessarily have to receive money. We all know that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you have accrual versus cash and, and all of that. But their point is that they may have never received anything of value in relation to this tax that's being imposed. And that what it really is, is. Um, taxing a property right as opposed to taxing income yeah and i think that's why you know th that's sort of where you kind of try to narrow the reach of this is to say you know is this really a tax on property and um and therefore it's not really an income tax and therefore you know it's outside the reach of the 16th amendment got that no that makes sense and i think that's why they're um uh, uh what, what the taxpayer submitted yesterday as you said was very interesting and probably i'm not sure clever is the right word but but yeah by them restricting and narrowing what they're looking at i think yeah maybe, very... maybe call it artful i mean we have we have some talented tax lawyers in this country <laughs> and it, and it's a joy to see you know the beauty of what what they come up with sometimes i mean farty yeah. you know i thought was you know, incredible as well, you know, because there were a lot of people who didn't think it was going to be decided that way. So. No, indeed, indeed. I mean, that's it. The Fahey case is interesting because I think many of us for many, many years have been saying that they had no ability to assess these penalties, but no one wanted to take it. So we're happy there are taxpayers out there that want to take those cases, that's for sure. So, um, so I guess uh, uh, some of the impact before we move on, because I'm, I'm not conscious of time. So here's, you, you mentioned in your, the, the, one of the last slides here, Liz, with regards to some of the impacts that could uh, um, that we could see. So maybe kind of briefly talk about, obviously we have the transition tax, but this could affect guilty, other passive income, some of the issues I've broached as well, I guess. Yeah, I agree. I think that, um, you know, either the taxpayer loses, uh, in which case all of this goes away, or, you know, you do have uh, a ruling for the taxpayer in maybe narrowly crafted on the transition tax. But then the question is, you know, what what happens in the aftermath of that and and how, where is the boundary really? And, and that's probably going to result in additional litigation yeah. over a number of years. Well, perfect. Thank you so much, Liz. I think on this one in particular, it is so fascinating. And I think it's watch this space for those of you interested, December 5th, um, uh, when 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 uh, uh, people hear uh, their sides of uh, each each side of the coin. So and I think Liz, as you said, probably would expect an, uh, a decision on this in the new year, I imagine. Right. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, thank you. Well, well look, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, this has been fascinating kind of uh, discussions around these three cases. I think, I think, Wayne, we have just one couple of things before we get to the Q&A that we just wanted to broach uh, around the CTA and the, um, I guess, uh, similarly, MY LTA, really. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Uh, Liz, 
describing tax attorneys as as joyful and artful is something <laughs> I've never heard of. I, I hope it extends to CPAs too. Of course, <laughs> anyone in tax world. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we do have a, a couple of, uh, uh, you know, speaking of disclosures and, and where international intersects with that, you know, we have the Corporate Transparency Act that is set to take effect uh, January 1st, 2024, where ultimate beneficial owner information is supposed to be disclosed on newly formed uh, U.S. entities. There are exceptions, of course, but... Um, you know, there's originally it was a 30 day compliance rule. Now they've extended to 90 days uh, for existing entities. We do have uh, an additional year uh, to transition to report the information. It's not exactly clear, you know, who is going to be collecting the information, whether it's going to be the state secretaries or potentially something that's rolled out through the IRS or, or FinCEN. And, uh, you know, the work is is. Uh, you know, it's it's basically compliance work, and it, it's actually probably a lot of due diligence work um, on the intake of of new clients and setting up new entities. So there are some states that have ruled that this is legal work, um, and you know there are um, there's a lot of the, there's a lot of uh, interesting things that could come of it. Where you know we already have international disclosures for single member U.S. single member LLCs that are owned by foreign companies um, or foreign owners. And this data collection on who owns these LLCs is, is probably going to provide the IRS or FinCEN a lot more data to cross-reference who's, you know, uh, who owns these things, what kind of payments are being made from, from these entities out to their foreign owners. And I would expect that there's probably going to be, you know, a couple of years of, of information that gets mismatched or you, you're going to see notices from the IRS or whomever is collecting the information that will start to question, hey, you know, where's your 5472 filing along with your uh, CTA filing disclosures when you, when you first uh, set these entities up? So I expect that there's going to be a lot of, uh, back and forth with this. Um, and, you know, states are, New York is coming out, has come out with their own uh, rule on the subject. And it's passed the New York state legislature. Later, it's it's waiting approval uh, and signature from the governor. So it'll go into effect as soon as the governor signs it. And the major difference between the federal CTA and the New York rule is that, you know, the New York uh, information might be publicly available. And so uh, that's a huge uh, privacy issue, obviously. And and uh, there, there must be millions of LLCs here in the U.S. I mean, definitely in the U.S., in New York City alone, uh, you know, a lot of property owners from outside of the U.S. own uh, uh, and, and U.S. domestic owners own property through LLCs. So this is going to have a huge impact in New York and and I expect um, nationwide. Yeah, thanks, Gwen. I think a couple of points on this one. I think there was a Q&A on the CTA that was issued in the last few days to mm -hmm. kind of help with people. So if anyone wants to see if uh, there's anything there of interest, which there is to help you guys, I said that certainly suggest looking at that Q&A. Um, and then I think as Gwen alluded to with me and my accent coming from the UK, um, this really does kind of smell and sound like what Companies House does in the UK with a lot of public information, particularly on the New York side. Um, and really, the, your, your anti-money laundering, know your client kind of exercise that Europe have been doing for many, many years now. Um, but I think um, New York LLC having it publicly searchable, um, I, I think that's just going to push many people away from setting up a New York LLC, probably. Um, <laughs> more than anything else. So de de Delaware are probably rubbing their hands even more. Um, so yeah, yeah, and, uh, and, and I'll just add one more comment is that you know, um, while we don't know how the information is really going to be collected yet, this yeah. is you know something that you probably should be bringing to the or, or you know your clients um, are going to ask about it, and it's probably work that that needs to be done by whomever set up the LLC, whether it's their attorneys or 
um, the state registrar or, you know, an online service that, that will facilitate that because it's uh, looking more and more like this is legal work and you're just going to have to ask more questions, just like you pointed out earlier, you know, it's KYC and, and before you set it up, you really need to know and ask questions of who's going to be the owner and, and get a lot of information from them, which, you know, includes passport information, really sensitive uh, PII, personal identification, uh, uh, personal um, information that is going to be really like a, a, a pain and, and uh, a lot of administration around keeping that information. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, we've got a few minutes left for questions. So uh, we've got a few questions that have come through. So I'm going to deal with the first one that came through from one of our guests. So with respect to the IRS arguing willful versus non-willful, in what scenarios do we see in this? Um, specifically, the individual feels as though the IRS has historically been quite lenient with taxpayers abroad versus those resident in the US. And if they use a program like the streamlined offshore versus, I think, their intimating quiet disclosure. Um, so really, they want to know what are our thoughts around this and how one uh, may best avoid a challenge in relation to non-willful. Um, I'll probably pass it over to Liz and Mario on this. My initial thoughts are and always have been, I tend to work with legal counsel and actually get some form of opinion on whether it's non-willful or willful. But Liz, Mario, well, maybe you can just briefly opine on that thought and question. Well, I do think it's true that there is more leniency for someone who um, is what I'll call an accidental American. I mean, we know, you know, folks who were born in the U.S. but really did not live in the U.S., you know, most of the time. And, you know, that distinction is made in the two offshore um, ones where the residency is a factor. Um, but you do have to really look closely at the facts, as Mario said earlier, and peel back the layers of the onion because, you know, if you've got tax returns filed and the box, you know, taxpayers are charged with knowing what's on their return, even though we know that a lot of taxpayers don't really look at their return, they get it, they sign the electronic filing form and they don't go through it in detail. But the IRS is not sympathetic to that argument. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would agree, Liz. I mean, the only thing I would add is I think it's on the accidental uh, citizen piece or, or resident, like like in uh, the uh, uh, was it the Arreste case? I think I think it really become comes down to the facts and how comfortable you are, right? And 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 going kind of a, above and beyond to try to get um, a letter, you know, rep letter from the client or or a more formal memo or or for legal opinion, as you would say, Kevin. You know, yeah. I I tend to side with putting putting together. Um, a memo to the file, right, that the client will concur on, right? To, yep. Especially because, this is, as we all know on this call, um, um, sometimes there are budgetary constraints as to giving a full blown legal opinion, right? Uh, and, or maybe, so, so I think that it's just well documenting the file well and putting together some type of memo uh, and having both um, the preparer, counsel, and the client all kind of agree. Is, is key, especially in today's environment. Yeah. And I think on that, there was another question, Mario, um, and the whole panel really uh, around, um, do we think that reliance, like is, is reliance on tax professionals such as us, could that count as non-willful? And I think probably to your point there, Mario, what well, my initial view of that is, assuming we've got the full facts and circumstances from the client, um, that dictates whether it's willful or non-willful, not our view and opinion of reliance of undertaking that compliance. I, I, right. I guess. So, yeah, definitely, definitely, because 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 you know there's all types of, of clients out there, and and as as you know, without getting political, right? There's a lot of stuff going on right there in Manhattan around a certain person, right? So you you, you don't want uh, clients to hide hide behind us, right? Or to manipulate us. So that you know, so I think those those days are long gone. And I think it, there's also you know, kind of jumping ahead, right? In terms of is are the courts trying to 
nudge the IRS into being more lenient? I, you know, I don't think so. I, I think it's it's really kind of trying to thread the needle, as Liz has told me several times, right? And making sure that, that the facts kind of match up with the law and and that the intention of the taxpayer, right, is is really where, where it should be, right? Yeah. And and I think they're holding Congress's feet to the fire because, you know, a lot of the outcome of these cases turns on the on the wording of these statutes, which, right. you know, it's Congress drafts them, the IRS is charged with enforcing them. Now the IRS does sometimes, you know, veer off into interpreting things more broadly than the language would permit. <clears throat> and the courts, the courts are there to rein that back. Yeah. Okay, I think, I mean, there was one last question here uh, in the Q&A related to the Moore case. Um, so we've got, I think we've just gone over, so maybe we'll just see if we have any views on this. Um, with more if the court rules the transition tax is unconstitutional, Liz thinks we're going to get to that point potentially, does it potentially hurt taxpayers if they were partners and they received 965 distributions, which may no longer be treated as distributions of PTEP? Um, which really revolves around, well, if it's not 965, well, what was it if there's been a subsequent distribution? So maybe we can kind of briefly talk around that. That's a juicy one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But in that, I guess in answer to the question, yes, it does. It, it, that does create an issue for that situation. You know, a huge issue. And it opens up a can of worms, right? It's kind of a almost like a slippery slope. Right and, yeah, you, you, know, you might Alan. end up owing more tax. Yeah, than, right. right. You actually right. brought the money back, and it's not PTAP, and it's just a straight distribution. Uh, it's it's you might end up owing the IRS even more. I I, I think you know there's there's an interesting side of this, right? I think that um you know TCJA brought in a dividends received deduction, right? And on the on the, in the corporate context, so um. I think the impact needs to be analyzed, especially as 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 you think of protective um, filings or 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 refund claims, right? Well, what what will this do, right? If you have if you have individuals or individuals that are sitting behind partnerships, like say in the, in the private equity context or closely held private equity context, I think there's a huge danger, right? If you're in the corporate context, you really have to determine whether or not the underlying earnings that that perhaps were not PTEP, right? Whether or not they would get the DRD um, uh, under TCJA, right? Because it's not that easy to get the DRD, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got some steps to, to jump through. And then you got to reverse, you got to go back and also adjust your bases. It, I mean, it's going to, it's going to make life so much fun for folks like, like all of us. If this yeah, no, exactly. The work involved, if the case goes, um in the favor of the taxpayer and the ramifications thereafter i think um yeah maybe we'll save that for another webinar that may take a whole morning um really so um well look thank you everyone um we've taken up enough of your precious time and thank you everyone for joining us um this is you know this is fascinating this stuff and it's if anyone has any questions you hopefully have our details um uh please feel free to reach out to any of us and uh, uh again thank you all for your time this morning and i hope everyone has a wonderful thanksgiving <laughs>